All right, we're going to continue with our tutorials through Chapter 4 of Principles of Econometrics with some simple non-linear models. Um, I'm going to combine several sections from the book into this chapter, and I will give kind of an overview of um, some of these. If you want more specific details on these different functional forms that are covered in the book, I highly recommend just going through the reading in the in the textbook. So. We'll keep going, and in this, we're going to continue to use our our data um, from the food um, data set, where we have um, food expenditure and income. This, of course, comes from the same location that it has been. And so let's talk about a few different functional forms. And so what I've plotted for you here is some basic functional forms we can think of that are nonlinear. So, for example, quadratic. Now, what's noticeable about quadratic? Well, a quadratic, the slope changes. It's not monotonic, all right? So mon a monotonic function means that it's always going up or it's always going down. Um, well, if we have a change in the relationship, so for example, um, oftentimes we'll see a, um, a, you know, our, our ability and um, acuity at driving and number of years of experience driving. It goes up to a peak, and then after a certain peak, it starts to start coming down from there, um, partially because of um, you know the the physical infirmity. Once we we get beyond a certain age, we just we know what to do. It's just harder for our bodies to do it. To there there just is a maximal peak. At some point, we kind of top out. That's the 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 best we are at driving. Um, and there's there's various things that are like this where it will go up for a little while and then down for a little or down for a little while and up for a little. So we have a change in the um, fundamental relationship at some point. Um, we have logarithmic, and they you can see how here we kind of either have kind of this exponential. It looks almost looks like exponential decay if it's decreasing, um, or this kind of increasing at a decreasing rate, and that's exactly what's going on. We have a we have a decreasing at a decreasing rate for the red line, and we have an increasing at a decreasing rate. Now in econ we use this so so much because we have this idea of diminishing returns. All right, so how much utility would get out of that first piece of pizza? Oh, it's a lot. All right, I'm really hungry. I really want that piece of pizza. By about the third piece of pizza, okay, I'm done. All right, the fourth, the fifth, okay, maybe it's not so great anymore. So it starts growing at a much slower, slower rate, right? And and that's what we see within that logarithmic, and that's why in econ um, we have so much application of log transformations. A cubic or higher order polynomial um, basically allows you to have what's a, called a change in concavity. Okay, so notice here that when I look at this cubic function, that I have this point here. This is called an inflection point. And if I looked at this function, you know, above that point, it makes a kind of bowl, right? Um, and so we say in, in mathematics, we'd call that concave up. Um, versus the, um, before that point, it kind of makes a cave. We call that concave down. In econ, oftentimes we'll call this part of the function convex and this part of the function concave. I, to be honest, I kind of like the math terms better because I think they're better. Um, they're more, more descriptive. But basically what's going on, um, from... Basically, this first part, we're increasing, but we're increasing at a decreasing rate. After that, we're increasing, and we're increasing at an increasing rate. In econ, we'll see that like, say, in a cost function. It's very often we'll see that, that costs will be increasing at a decreasing rate. We'll get economies of scale up to a certain point, and then all of a sudden we're big, or we get too big, and we start getting diseconomies of scale, and so costs will increase at an increasing rate. Um, but whenever you have some kind of reason to believe there's this change in concavity or there's some kind of inflection point in the data, you know, a cubic or, or higher order polynomial um, might be in order. Um, and then the final one that we see an awful lot of, especially in econ, is exponential. 
All right, so great example of that is compound interest. That's a form of exponential growth. Um, you know, number of number of cases uh, in a pandemic. That's an example of exponential growth. Um, I heard a really great example of exponential growth just in, um, I'm not even sure the person knew they were giving this example, but they were referring to a, a disease in fish. So if you have an aquarium, you've heard of a disease called ick. And he said, well, all right, so you don't have any, and then you have like one or two spots, and then all of a sudden you have dozens and dozens of, of these little white spots all over your fish. And that's ick. And well, that's an example of exponential growth because that's exactly what happens. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, and then poof, right? Um, and it, it grows, well, exponentially. Um, so these are some of the basic functional forms. Where would we use what? Well, it really comes down to a few things. One, what does your data look like? To what's the underlying theory predict about this data? So if I'm looking at a cost function, maybe I'm interested in something like this, where I have this ability to change in concavity. If I'm looking at, say, a utility function, um, and I know there's going to be these diminishing returns, maybe I'm looking at some kind of a logarithmic. Um, if I, if I know there is some kind of change in the relationship, so it's positive for a range and then negative, or negative for a range and then positive, well, that's where this idea of this quadratic comes in. And so really, I think one of the most important things to do is we look at what's the underlying theory driving what we believe about this relationship between x and y. So if we keep going... I'm probably going to say something along those lines, a theoretical relationship, plot of the data, and then our residual diagnostics. And that's something that's really, really important to remember. Oftentimes, when our residuals look hinky, it's because there's actually underlying nonlinearity in the relationship, and we're trying to force it into a linear um, box. Um, if we try to use linear regression to model a nonlinear relationship, what we're going to get is something that isn't quite right. Um, it might be close. It might be close within a, a, a certain range of the data, but you know we get outside of that kind of relevant range, we start to run into problems. And so oftentimes when we see hinkiness in the residual diagnostics, it's an indicator that we may need to go back and look and make sure our functional form is up to snuff, that, it, that we don't need to account for some linearity. All right, so this is a gigantic table. It's in the textbook. It's also here. I find this incredibly useful. Um, you know, if you want a little more advanced homework assignment, derive each one of these. You can do it very simply just using basic calculus. It's not terribly difficult, but that's really what's going on here. Um, it's just basic calculus. And what we want to do is we want to see, well, what's the slope? What's How much does y change? Y, not the log of y, but y. How much does y change when x changes? And that's what this tells you. Um, and we can see the different relationships along there. Um, like I said, this table is also in the textbook. And then we also have a concept called elasticity. Now, elasticity is a really important concept in economics, but in other places too, because what we want to look at is the percent change in one variable over the percent change in another. What that does is it gets rid of the units. So it's independent of... of how we measure y, how we measure x, we're still going to get the number, same number. Um, you, know, you know, if we want to look at the price elasticity of bananas, if we didn't do this as a percentage change type calculation, you know, the difference between, we would get a different number if we calculated it per banana versus per, um, you know, bunch of bananas per you know shipment of bananas we get different numbers but since we do this as a percentage change over percentage change if we do different units different levels of bananas we still get the same number um, and that's really an important an important aspect to this um, so each one of these gives you this measure of elasticity um, 
which is really, really useful. And so we look at something like the log-log model, we notice all of the coefficients basically give us measurements of elasticities, which is why that log-log model is actually kind of useful, and we sometimes really quite like that model, especially in, say, like a if we're estimating demand for something, because oftentimes that elasticity is more important to us than, um, say, just the um, you know the simple simple slope of the model. Okay, well, I, I really encourage you to have a look at this. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them as a homework assignment. You may want to go ahead and try to try to derive each one of these. It's a, it would be a um, you'd have a better understanding of what's going on. All right, so let's try some example regressions. Okay, so the first one we're going to do is the linear log model. I'm not going through all of those models that we've talked about and all the models that are in the, in the chapter. You can go back and read through those. I'm going to go through some of the really important ones. And the linear log model is probably one of the more, definitely the more important ones within business and economics. Um, and so we're going to estimate this, and we're going to call that mod 2, and we're going to do food expenditure, but on the log of income. Now, this is something that's really, really handy in um, R. I didn't have to create the log of income before I actually did the regression. I can just do that entirely right here inside the LM function, and that's really handy. Um, so I just pass, instead of passing income, I pass the log. Now, log in in mathematics and in, in R um, stands for the natural log or log base E. All right, if you know about logs, great. If not, in engineering, log will often be the LOG will stand for log base 10. So just note um, that, well, we don't all, oh, we're not consistent. Uh, it just isn't. I don't know how to do it. I didn't do it. So, um, you know, um, and, you know, in Microsoft Excel, the natural log is LN. In engineering, the natural log is LN instead of LOG, um, where LOG is considered the common log or base 10. Well, we will use the notation that's used in R. And so LOG will always refer to the natural log or log base E. And if you know what I'm talking about, great. If you don't, then we're just always going to use LOG for logs. Okay, so let's take a look at this. What is what's our estimation look like? And it is a little bit different. Okay, um, notice our coefficients different because well, our um, dependent our independent variables are different. And so well, there we go. That looks cool. Um, it's more interesting if we look at the actual plot. So this is actual versus fitted. Up here is the code that I'm using to do this. Now note, I needed the tidyverse because I needed two packages. I needed ggplot and I needed dplyr. So dplyr gives me this great little character and what this is is a pipe operator. It's a, and the pipe operator works like this. It says, with food, do all this crap on the right. Or basically, shoot this stuff that's on the left, pipe it through to the thing that's on the right. So I'm going to take the data in, in food and pipe it to ggplot. ggplot now knows that I'm using food, so I don't have to tell it that again. And I'm going to use income and food expenditure. All right, that's going to be my x and y. And then I'm going to go through here, and I'm going to tell um, ggplot, I really want you to plot for me the actual regression line. And so I'm going to say, OK, I want you to use a linear method, but here's the formula I want. And I'm going to tell it the formula, y on log x. And here where it says se equals true, that just gives me the standard error of, um, so um, back when we were talking about prediction in the very first one, that predict, if we did confidence intervals, this is basically giving me kind of a confidence, a kind of sort of a confidence interval around, it's actually the standard error of y hat throughout all of the values of y hat. Okay, so we have, we have all that, that's cool, and this last bit just makes it, I think, look prettier, but yeah, it's up to you. Um, we can see 
Okay, this does a little bit better, but I still have this kind of flaring out and it doesn't really deal with that as much. So let's look at another one. Let's look at the residual versus fit plot. And well, we still, yeah, I don't think this, I don't think we've really improved our situation that much with this particular model. So let's keep going. Maybe we can find a different one. Okay, let me get rid of my scribbles here. Oh, stop. There. Okay, got rid of my scribbles. So let's look at mod three and let's do a log linear model. So we're gonna log the dependent variable and not the independent variable. Okay, so it's a log linear model. And here we see, again, it looks very different. Um, this really doesn't tell me too much. Let's go ahead and look at the plots. And all right, so when I log the dependent variable, I can no longer pull all the same tricks. I actually need to log this, put this on a log scale. Okay, so this is actually the log of y on this scale, and that's why I have a linear relationship or a straight line here. Um, I just told it to go ahead and just plot a straight line through there. And, well, you know, that one's actually starting to look a little bit better. That one doesn't look, that one doesn't look too horrible. Let's look at the next one, which is the log log model. We log both of them. Again, um, the regression results don't necessarily tell you that much. We've got an R squared, and the R squared is a little bit higher, but we have to be really, really careful with R squared. That's not a model selection criteria um, and really shouldn't be used as one. We'll talk about model selection in Chapter 5 a little bit. Um, but overall, there we go, and this is what it looks like. It's okay. So, you know, if we plotted out the residual versus fit, I think we actually are the residual versus fitted model. I think actually we like the the log linear model the best. It, it actually turns out to to fit this data the best, I believe. OK, next, we're going to talk a little bit about prediction. And we want to talk about prediction in, say, this log linear model. Basically, any time we take the log of the dependent variable y, we need to be a little bit careful because oftentimes we don't care about the log of y. We care about y. And so we want to predict y. Well, a natural way to do that is if we log y, well, let's just unlog y. And the unlog function is the exponentiate function. Or basically, what we have is e to the log y equals y. All right, it just undoes logging it. And so if I exponentiate the left-hand side of the equation, I have to exponentiate the right-hand side of the equation. Okay, well, and this works just fine, except um, it's basically, it's known to be biased. Um, but there's a really, really easy bias correction, which is I just multiply by that guy, or um, I can go ahead and just put it in here. So I'm going to add back, and this sigma hat is the um, um, uh, 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 residual standard error, or, or the, the the standard error of residuals, or the, I, I guess, in I believe in R it's called the residual standard error, or the standard error of regression. Okay? And then I square that, and that gives me the variance of regression, I guess. Divide that by two, and that gives me my, um, that gives me my, um, um, correction factor. It's usually very small, and so it doesn't make that big a deal, but it's still, it's a bias, it corrects the bias, and so you should do it, um, mostly because it's easy. And so let's calculate and compare those predictors. So this first one is just ex exponentiating without a correction. This second one here is exponentiating with a correction. We can get this sigma hat all right, or the sigma from the summary. So to get this standard error of regression, the easiest way to do that is to take a summary of the model and store that into an object. Then within that object, within that summary object, there'll be a component called sigma. Now, I'm just 
adding in here the squared part so that I get sigma hat squared. So all I have to do is divide by two when I get down here. Okay. If that's confusing, just go ahead and make an appointment with me. We'll talk it through and I'll show you one on one. Okay, so let's go ahead and plot these two models. So all this is is the ggplot stuff that plots those two models. And what we can see here is this blue line is my corrected version, and the red line is the uncorrected prediction using a log linear model. And so what we see is that they are just a smidge different. So this distance between here, uh, between these two predictions, that's the bias. It's a well-known bias. It's really easy to crack, so, well, we do it. All right, great. I think that wraps us up for this one. So I'll see you in Chapter 5.